Well, I guess it is. Well, uh, to start, gotcha. Because <laughs> you probably all walked right past me over there and were like, oh, I wonder where that leech house is. Uh, lesson one on truth, do not believe what you see on the internet. Uh, and when uh, they ask you to submit a photo, maybe uh, put one in that's not like five years old. Um, and uh, if you guys came here expecting some kind of like philosophical thing or, or whatever, you're, you're not going to get that. Uh, but here, here uh, you know, as best as I can approximate it, uh, truth, right? So I'll start where I usually start when I'm pursuing something with Google. Uh, so what is truth? Uh, the state or quality of being true. Well, that tells us all of nothing uh, about what truth is. Uh, true is in accordance with fact or reality. And, or to be accurate or exact. And in journalism, we like to think that that is what we're doing all the time. Um, but I think we all know that there are lots of different kinds of truths. And a big question I ask myself a lot while reporting is, whose truth? Um, so for most of you know, this country's history in, in the media, the arbiters of truth have been people like this guy. Who recognizes this guy? Not you. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Here, well, here's a better picture of him. Uh, this is uh, Josephus Daniels. He was the publisher of the NNO, uh, notorious for helping egg on the 1898 Wilmington Massacre. He was a white supremacist, and he you know, really led the vision of the most influential paper in this area for a long time. And so are we going to depend on this guy and his, his perception to tell us what truth is? Uh, you know, I think when we... You know, when I was in journalism school or college, you know, whatever, uh, they, you know, there was this idea that the media ha was objective, that there was this kind of idea of truth that floated above our identities and our personalities that you could somehow access or tap into if you completely erase yourself from the equation. And, and that's not true, right? Because you can't check your privilege at the door. You can't um, you know, pretend like the experiences that have formed you are not a part of um, your reporting and your perspective. Uh, so I try, you know, I, I try to stay grounded in, in, in my own perspectives and remember, you know, my own bias when I'm, when I'm trying to approach a story. Um, so a lot of you guys probably remember this. Uh, a couple years ago, there were um, a series of uh, protests in Raleigh over the Black Lives Matter movement. It, you know, was happening nationwide, and here in Raleigh, things got pretty intense. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of protesters, hundreds of cops facing off in the street for what felt like days. There was violence, um, you know, there was tear gas, there was rubber bullets. And, and it really felt like chaos. And I guess, you know, as a journalist, there's, there's a part of, uh, I think there's a gene a lot of us journalists share that makes us both brave and, and very stupid. Uh, so when stuff like this happens, instead of running away, we, we, we're, something just kind of drives us to run straight toward it, straight toward the scary thing. And, and even if, you know, you don't really know what the situation is yet. Um, you know, oftentimes when there's a breaking news story like this, I get a text or a call from an editor saying, run down there, and I'm not sure what I'm gonna find, right? I mean, I can look on Twitter, rest in peace, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you can't, um, <laughs> but as you know, you can't trust what you see on the internet, right? Because, you know, somebody could post a picture that's five years old, and that, that's a, a version of the truth, right? Um, but what really struck me about um, you know, reporting from this incident were just all the divergent narratives that seemed to be colliding. Um, you, know, you had the, the narrative from the police and the, kind of the institutional um, thing you know, saying, oh, well, yeah, of course we support Black, Black Lives Matter, but we've got to keep the city safe and we've got to shut this down. And then you have the protesters um, you know, really fighting for something that I think uh, you know, felt felt like it was really going to make a change at the time. Um, and in a lot of ways, it did make substantial changes to our city. 
Um, so when thinking about what perspectives to bring to the story and, and who to highlight, um, you know, who, whose opinions mattered here? Um, you know, this photo by our photographer Jade Wilson really struck me because I feel like, you know, this, this uh, you know, they say photos a thousand words or whatever. I think there's a lot more here. Um, you know, you can't see the face of the protester and their hands are up. And you can't see the faces of the police officers either. And they're all kind of construed in their own armor. Um, and kind of when going into a situation like this, um, you know, I'm not on either side as a journalist, right? I'm not necessarily rooting for the protesters, nor am I rooting for the police. But I'm trying to kind of find that middle ground where both, both perspectives can be true at the same time, right? Because I think oftentimes, um, I had this uh, editor, Ralph Tomaselli, back in Connecticut. He used to say, uh, truth is often stranger than fiction because there can be multiple perspectives that can both be true. And I think those contradictions, uh, you know, they make our stories richer and they make our reporting richer. Um, so while I was reporting for this, um, the Indy Week's office, uh, former office on Wilmington, ended up being ransacked. Um, you know, as I said, I'm kind of one of those brave and stupid people. I grabbed my phone, I ran downtown, or you know, drove downtown, and you know, followed followed people. They were, um, you know, as police were, you know, lighting off um, tear gas. I uh, I ducked inside my office uh, to try to get some water in my eyes, and somebody threw a brick through the window, and I hid in the basement, um, and I was scared in a way that I usually don't get when reporting on these stories. I feel like um, I, I said this before. Uh, to another person, but you know, I find chaos kind of calming sometimes. I don't really have to think about anything but doing my job, uh, and I'm able to kind of just be in go mode and and really t you know put myself in the moment. But when something like this happens, it really kind of shakes you um, to your core. And so I hid in the basement. Um, you know, I can hear people walking around the office. I can hear people moving around. I called my friend. Um, Jordan, another reporter, and he ended up meeting me and helping me get away from the building safely. And I didn't know how, just how bad it would be until the next morning when um, I came back to the office and it looked like this. Uh, the whole office was a loss, my computer was smashed, and um, it was pretty devastating. I mean, I think, you know, I, I kind of felt like not like my business was any different than any of the other businesses, but just, you know, to be involved on that level in what was happening, uh, you know, is not something you're, you expect or are prepared for. And so I sent out that tweet, and that tweet ended up going viral with the alt-right, another internet lesson for you. And so they decided that their take on the story from the Daily Wire and Post Millennial and some other, um, you know, outlets kind of catering to right-wing conservatives that, uh, you know, I kind of got what I deserved, right? I was celebrating these rioters. I was out there tweeting and reporting, and, uh, and you know what? Like, she got what she deserved. She celebrated the protesters, and then she, they smashed her office. And um, for the next week or so, my inbox was filled with all of the most vile things that you can imagine from, you know, the people that lurk in the dark corners of the Internet you know, threatening me with all sorts of bodily harm. And, you know, it's just really a surreal experience to feel like, one, like, you're, you're trying to find out the truth of the situation, and then there's, like, this kind of stuff going on that just throws a complete curveball at it. For some people, this is the truth, right? It wasn't my truth, but... Um, so when thinking about how to kind of throw that, all of that stuff into a story... You know, I, I had a lot of difficulty with it, and I had to, you know, I wrote this story, I think, on a Monday after all of this had happened. And, you know, it, it didn't feel right to just zoom in on the moment. It didn't feel right to start with an individual. So I thought that the, the best thing to do to put what had happened that weekend in context, and the weekend, by the way, was um, the weekend that the uh, protesters tore down the Confederate statue on Juneteenth. Um, and I decided the best way to put it in context is really to zoom out 
um, and kind of show the historical gravity of not just like, here's like, you know, one statue coming down, but where did that statue come from? And, um, you know, I guess, and so I did my research, as I, as, I, as I like to do, and I found out, you know, it was built by this guy, Octavius Cope, who obviously was a white supremacist and really liked the Confederacy. And they were able to bankroll this for $700,000 in today's money. Um, and this statue stood for 31 times longer than the Confederacy did. And, you know, as, as I wrote, you know, it cast its shadow from the Jim Crow era through the civil rights movement. The two our Confederate dead monument loomed over Hillsborough Street, taller than the old state house itself. Its message twofold. For the whites that looked at the South's treasonous interaction with a mythologized mix of affection, pride, and heritage, it was a welcome sign. For people of color, it may as well have read whites only. And I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to put into words what, you know, what I imagine so many people felt like when walking around downtown Raleigh and having to look at that. And that was, I guess, what I really wanted people to think about, was not just, you know, the violence of the weekend or, you know, just, you know, the, the police and, and all of that. I wanted people to think about, what, you know, this statue was there every day, and people in this community had to look at that statue every day, and this is what it meant to them. Um, and so on to, um, you know, something I more recently reported. Um, I, was at, I work at a restaurant. I'm a waitress, too, because, you know, journalism is really lucrative. Uh, so I'm at, I'm at my restaurant, and I get a call from an editor at the Daily Beast who tells me, there's an active shooter. You have to... You have to run down there. And I, I kind of make an excuse to uh, the restaurant, and I'm like, hey, I got to go. Um, and so kind of without really knowing anything about what was happening, you know, I, I think the only words I knew was like white male shooter uh, teenager. You know, I, uh, I started reporting on the story. And I think oftentimes, you know, how do you approximate truth when you have so little information? And any piece of information can change a story dramatically. When, when this first broke, I mean, you know, you have so many assumptions you want to bring into it. You're like, well, you know, is this kind of some white supremacist incel thing? I mean, was this, you know, someone who was kind of radicalized by the internet? You don't know any of that when you're first running onto a scene. Um, and you really have to try to, you know, be open to the nuances of the situation. Um, and at those times, I think I really just rely on trying to have relationships with the people that I'm talking to and trying to build trust with them. And I think that, you know, when, when the truth is murky, um, one thing that is generally close to truth are people's experiences. Um, so I was able to talk to Tracy Howard, who found his wife, um, you know, dead on his front stoop. Uh, that afternoon, and, um, you know, his grief is something that I think uh, it will stay with me for the rest of my life, but the things that I remember most about it are the, you know, he had a bunch of plants that looked like they hadn't been watered, um, you know, on his front stoop, and, you know, he's sitting in the chair a foot away from, from where he found her, uh, and, you know, I can't imagine sitting there uh, and having to just go through that. And the pain of that community was just, you know, it's something that you, that as a reporter, you know, I've recovered a lot of really tragic situations. Um, but you really don't think that something like this is going to happen in your town, let alone, you know, 10 minutes from where you live. So I reported on that for national outlets all over the all through the weekend. Um, you know, mostly just walking around the neighborhood with my phone and a notebook, just trying to talk to people. Um, you know, I think the national kind of thirst was to find out a lot about the shooter. Locally, we wanted to know more about about the victims, uh, and so the NNO had um, this as their cover story on Sunday. And I remember I was actually uh, at a gas station. 
I was, uh, I was picking up, like, I think it was like a Red Bull because I was tired, and I saw that this was the cover. And I got mad in a way that, like, I don't usually get because it just felt kind of trivializing. It felt kind of, like, patronizing. Like, why? Like, newspapers are supposed to have a point of view. Like, we're supposed to stand up to things that are wrong. And, and so I, I didn't think that this was good enough for our, uh, for our local daily paper. And um, I'm lucky to have uh, friends still at Indie Week who, who trust me with some crazy ideas. So um, I wrote that. And, um, you know, got to love a good old classic, like, newspaper war. We don't have those anymore. Like, I want to start some, like, real fights, you know, in the metaverse or whatever. But I guess what I just wanted to say with this is, like, sometimes truth is, like, just really simple. And sometimes it hits you in the face. And all it takes is a little bit of bravery to just say what the obvious thing to say is, which is, you know, there are 12 guns for every 10 people in this country. And the, and the only country that, ha and the country with the second most amount of guns, you're not gonna guess it because it's Yemen and they have five guns for every 10 people. So we have more than twice the amount of guns per capita as any other country in the world and we still ask this question. Um, I don't think being a journalist means that you have to give up your opinions. And I don't think, you know, as I said, I mean, objectivity is kind of a myth. I'm coming from where I'm coming from here, so yeah. And what about reporting on um, things that are a little outside your comfort zone? Like, as I said, like, I can feel pretty calm in a lot of chaotic situations, uh, and I can find ways to relate to a lot of people. Uh, reporting on this uh, Trump rally in Greenville uh, really made me feel like a fish out of water. And I was there with, um, you know, all the big wigs from the national media uh, you know, people, I'm standing alongside people from the New York Times. I'm a little community journalist. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I going to write a story that's going to even be remotely different? Um, and, and so I kind of did what I, what I kind of fall back on a lot of times is I, I focused on what I could see, what I could feel, what I could hear. I focused on the people. And I talked to as many people as I could. And not the people that were speaking on the stage, but just the little guys. This guy made these hats uh, that he didn't think looked like, you know, World War II inspired helmets. Uh, I, I, and I, you know, I felt like too, I was just, I was mesmerized by everybody's cell phones and just the, the kind of eagerness of everybody wanting to be a part of this moment that also like, you know, as it's unfurling, you don't know what's happening. You know, this photo too, I just, you know, I feel like they're just, there's things that you don't usually get to see, right? So when I was putting together this story, um, you know, I really just relied on, um, on what I saw. And so this is how I, um, I put it together. We'll never know who started the chant. Perhaps it was the guy in the red MAGA helmet or the woman in the pink Trump girl t-shirt with high-heeled shoes emblazoned with the American flag. Maybe it was the man who, in between mouthfuls of peanut M&Ms, had told me he'd been there since 7.30 this morning browsing Trump gear in the parking lot. Or one of the women who said they followed the president from state to state like groupies chasing a rock star. Or just a teenager with an iPhone aloft looking to strike viral gold. Whoever it was, he or she sparked what felt like a defining political movement moment. One voice became two, became four, became a dozen, became hundreds, became thousands, until it became a roar that reverberated through the East Carolina University's Williams Arena Wednesday night. Send her back, send her back, send her back. And that's the line that everyone remembers, right? Because that was, that was the headline and that was the kind of thing. But for me, it was all of these weird characters that kind of had assembled and created this moment organically um, that I, I found so interesting. And, and you know, I, I feel like a lot of these people, I couldn't, I couldn't have different, more, my opinions couldn't be more different from theirs. But, um, you know, I, th I thought that, you know, as a writer, I get to, I hate, I hate being on stage, by the way. This is everything I hate because I, because usually I get to be on the other side, right? And when I get to do something like this, I get to be the director, I get to be the actors, the cinematographer, 
Um, you know, I, I get to kind of have control over the way you tell a story. I think there are a lot of young writers who are afraid uh, to trust themselves. I remember, um, you know, I used to feel like when I was first starting out, my whole job is just to get these quotes right, and, and that's about it. No. There's a lot, you, you know, I think, you know, as a writer, everything is in our toolbox. What we see, you know, what we feel, you know, we can paint a picture beyond just, you know, what the people at the podium are saying. And I think that that's what makes stories powerful and that that's what makes stories stay with us, um, you know, when they feel real. And, you know, what, what is the truth here, right? <laughs> For me, the truth were, was we're kind of just these individuals. Um, and I guess I just wanted to, to finish on um, just another story that I did is, uh, how do you tell other people's truth? Because, you know, I think it's one thing to say, um, you know, I can, I can write a story that says, well, here's my approximation of the truth from where I was standing. But what about somebody else's truth? Um, so for this story, uh, Scott Crawford was very generous to sit down with me for several hours and um, talk about his struggle with addiction. Um, he's an award-winning restaurant restauranteur in the area, um, and he's and he has uh, he's been sober, I believe, for almost two decades now. And um, so, for this story, we sat down and we talked. I mean, we talked for hours and hours, just you know, about his whole life. And I I ended up kind of sitting there with you know the longest transcript or one of the longest transcripts I'd ever had to go through, and being like, how am I going to turn this into a, into a thousand word cohesive story? Um, and, you know, so for an as-told-to story, you're writing in someone else's voice. So I wrote this story in the first person, trying to, trying to be Scott Crawford. Um, and I haven't had any of his experiences. I mean, I can't pretend to abandon my perspective. But for me, it was a really interesting um, experiment, and I thought we had some really good results just in... Um, you know, I think getting out of my comfort zone and getting into a voice that isn't my own, um, it pushed me some unique places. And I think as creators, um, you know, trying out different formats that uh, might make us uncomfortable, uh, sometimes they can, that, can, that can get really interesting results. Uh, so I don't know if that was like a rambling diatribe of uh, nonsense or whatnot, uh, but I guess I'll just end it uh, with uh, a quote from my favorite movie. Uh, Hamlet 2. Uh, <laughs> truth uh, truth is, is, a, is a nebulous commodity. Um, you know, I think that we, we live in a world, and if you live on the internet, uh, a world where there are kind of all of these swirling truths all around you. And, you know, you get to kind of decide, us, the arbiters of our iPhones, the internet, our social media, you get to decide what, what you think truth is. Um, and I think, you know, approach it with a grain of salt, but also the best way for me at least uh, to feel, to, to, to sense if something is true is, is sensing if I, I am telling my truth in the moment. Um, and if I am allowing myself to be vulnerable, if I am allowing myself to be open to nuance, surprises, the unexpected. Um, you know, I think that if you can feel like you are acting in a way that is true, that the truth might come to you. That was me as a baby journalist. Um, and I guess, do, I, do, we, do we get questions or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone has a question for me. Yeah, uh, be vulnerable, you know. I think, you know, don't try to put up a front like you know what you're doing. I think oftentimes my greatest asset is, is um, I try to be humble and I try to say, you know, I'm, I'm here to listen to you. You know, I think a lot of times 
people come in very pushy with their own perspective and agenda. And I feel like a lot of times sources just want to be heard, and they don't want to feel like they're being guided toward you know, that kind of pull quote that everyone's looking for. Um, I guess for me, you know, this has been an evolving process of, of trying to own my truth. You know, I'm not this long-haired young journalist anymore, and a lot of times that makes me uncomfortable, and I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? You know, get up in front of this group looking as I do. Um, but I think the more that I'm able to let go of those insecurities and just kind of own it, um, if I'm able to be comfortable in my own skin, then I hope I can allow people the same space when I'm trying to interview and build a relationship with them to do the same. Um, so I guess just drop your front. Anyone else? <laughs> Oh man, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you write a lot. Um, I mean, I guess this, I, I like the stories that, are, that have a really compelling per personality kind of at the center of them. I think I've done a lot of profiles. Um, I, I did a very uh, in-depth profile on Nancy McFarland, um, the former mayor, and I felt like uh, it was really interesting to get inside her head. I think that was a story full of contradictions, right? Because you have, you know, nobody's term, political term, is all success. You know, we're we're kind of a mixture of of, of damages and triumph. So how do you assess, um, you know, somebody with a complicated tenure? And I think Nancy, one of the things I liked about her a lot is she does have a lot of humility. Is that she's very much a normal person when you talk to her, and she doesn't have that kind of like politician's front. Um, so I felt like she took her walls down with me and allowed me to kind of get really close um, and kind of see her more as a person and less as, you know, the talking head behind the podium. You'll notice I don't want to stand behind this podium. It scares me. I'm not a podium person. Uh, that story, and um, weirdly a story I, I, I think about more than I should. I wrote about uh, these salamanders about a year ago, uh, the Noose River water dog. And I guess it's, I, I keep thinking about them because they're weird, right? They're, they're going extinct. There's development everywhere. There's all these weird scientists that are chasing these guys, um, you know, trying to study them as they're kind of disappearing from our area. And, and the thing I kept thinking about was that, um, you know, water dogs are kind of like babies forever. They retain their baby features and they look like axolotls. Uh, I might be butchering that word. Um, you know, so in a way, it's like you have this kind of, this animal that is itself a contradiction. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, in a, in a way it's dying out, in a way, you know, they kind of are, are eternal children um, exploring the depths. And I guess for that too, I mean, you know, it's hard to put your, your, your it's hard to, it's hard to uh, tell a story from the perspective of a salamander, but I guess that's really what I, I tried to do. Um, I. <laughs> I, uh, I thought about, uh, you know, salamanders kind of slithering in the mud, um, you know, in the bottom of the stream and, and, and kind of their dark, their dark lives, um, you know, but also kind of the levity of these weird, silly creatures that grow to be a foot long almost um, that people are just so fascinated by. Uh, so, yeah, salamanders. <laughs> Run, just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, honestly, I think there's a lot of gloom and doom about journalism is dying, Twitter's shutting down, what are we all gonna do? I think journalism is changing, and I think that, um, you know, I think we have to embrace the change, and I think the people who are gonna be most successful are, are those who are able to adapt. Um, you know, I, you know, the legacy, le legacy media companies and the idea that, you know, you're gonna have one source of news that's on your, on your front doorstep every Sunday. That's not, the, that's not the world we live in anymore. That's not the information world we live in. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I think it's a changing landscape and that can be scary, but like also realizes that, realize that like the next generation, they're gonna be the ones to set the rules. And you know, they don't have to play 
like you know my generation or the generation before me did. Um, you know, and I think you know when I think about you know objectivity and and my approach to reporting, you know, it's I think a lot of people are you know can criticize that and say, oh well, you know that's opinion writing, that's not journalism. But you know, I think what I write for me feels true. Um, and I try, to bring, I try to bring the perspective that's closest to the truth there. So I think, yeah, um, you know, people who are able to kind of adapt and move quickly and understand that, you know, that the industry as it is now is not what it will look like in five years, they're going to be the most successful. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Is this what I imagined? No, I hate being in front of people. Uh, as I said, like put me behind a screen where I'm nice and safe. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those stubborn, stupid people that I was like four years old when I was like narrating to my mother my first book. So I kind of always wanted to be a writer. Um, you know, I think I really fell into journalism the way a lot of people do, is that I was one of those weirdos in college and the only place that I felt like I really fit in was the, was the little, university newspaper office where we would just plug in until two in the morning. Um, you know, those were my kind of weirdos, so I guess I just kind of stick around. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I tried. <laughs>